Welcome to lecture 4.2, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. As before, we will assume that A is an n by n matrix over an algebraically closed field K. So it's an endomorphism of X. We will define the characteristic polynomial of A to be the determinant of Ti minus A, where T is a variable. We write that as PA of T, or if A is understood, just p of t. Now I should mention that a lot of books use different variables and different conventions. So in your undergraduate class, you likely saw p of lambda, so lambda being the variable. I'm going to use a different variable as I do for roots. So lambda will be the, the root or the eigenvalues of this, but I don't want to call that the variable as well. So you might also see p of x or P of S in other books. And something that you have likely seen either in your introductory course or in my previous lecture is the determinant of A minus lambda I instead of lambda I minus A or Ti minus A. Now, A minus lambda I and T, or, or A minus Ti and Ti minus A just differ by negative one. And so the determinant of ti minus a is just negative 1 to the n times the determinant of a minus ti, because we're pulling out a negative 1 from each of the n columns. So that's going to be either plus or minus the original determinant, depending on the parity of n. Now, this is probably more common, especially in introductory courses. But the reason why I'm going to use this convention, and it really doesn't matter because we're interested in the roots, and it doesn't, you know, we can stick a 13 out front and still get the same roots, is that I want um, this to be a monic polynomial. In other words, I want this to be t to the n plus something. Whereas if we use this convention, um, then what we get is we'll get negative 1 to the n times t to the n. For example, if, if we compute the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix, say 1 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda, 4 minus lambda, and I don't know, th these are some other values, what you get is, is negative lambda cubed, and that's, that's not what we want. It's easier if things are monic. Here is what that determinant looks like. There's a negative aij entry everywhere, and along the diagonal, there's an additional t. Before we proceed, I want to make two important remarks that will be useful throughout this lecture. The first one is an alternate way to think about the determinant, which we went over in the lecture on determinants of matrices. So please watch that if you have not. And this is not really an efficient way to compute determinants, but it is helpful in some circumstances to think about them. And this is one of those circumstances. So the determinant of a matrix M, I'm using M instead of A because this matrix up here isn't A, it's Ti minus A, is a sum over all n factorial permutations of the signature of a permutation times m pi 1 1, m pi 2 2, all the way up to m pi n n. Now, remember what this is. So this first term, this entry m pi 1 1, lives in the first column. So it's, it's one of these. And then the next one lives in the second column, and so forth. So what we are doing is we are literally taking the product of one element per row and one element per column in all possible ways to do this. So for example, one such way is this entry t minus a11 times maybe negative a32 times negative a23 maybe times and maybe times these two diagonal entries here. So this is one way to do that, and there are n factorial ways. Notice one per column, and then the, the ordering of the rows is given by some permutation. So this is something that we will use throughout. And the other thing I want to mention is that the characteristic polynomial, this thing here, this determinant, when you multiply this thing out, it, it has degree n. You, you can see that because you actually get, um, so, so let's think about where the t to the n comes from. That comes from 
what you get when you multiply all of the diagonal entries. So, so one of the terms in here comes from this product of diagonal entries, and that will produce a t to the n. And that's the only one that does, so it will not cancel. Finally, the roots of this characteristic polynomial are the eigenvalues of a. That's something that we, we saw earlier. Remember, our notation from a previous lecture was determinant of a minus lambda i is 0 if and only if there exists a non-zero vector uh, v in the null space of a minus lambda i. So when that happens, um, lambda is going to be a or the, lambda is going to be a root of this polynomial. So this so this polynomial is degree n, and the roots are the eigenvalues. That's probably something you already knew from your introductory linear algebra course, but it is still worth restating here. Our first result is a characterization of two familiar quantities, the trace and the determinant, in terms of the eigenvalues. Namely, the trace is just the sum, and the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. It is not overly technical to verify these two identities, but it is a little bit notationally messy. And so I've put the determinant of ti minus a right here. And I really want to emphasize that um, if you have not already, please go back and watch my lecture on determinants of matrices. Because what I did there is I took the determinant of a 3 by 3, say a11, a12, a13, a21, a22, a23, a31, a32, a33, as a sum of these six permutation matrices. So a11, a22, a33 times 1, 1, 1, this minus, and then there's the one where you take, take this product, so minus um, a12, a21, a33 times 1, 1, Let's see, this, this permutation matrix, the determinant of this is, um, actually, I, I should probably say it's plus this times the determinant of that because that the determinant of this is minus 1, and then there, there's going to be six more of these things. So every one of these permutation matrices will arise, and that's, that's where this formula comes from. So the trace of A is just the sum of these diagonal entries. Well, I guess the, the AIIs, so without the T and without the negative sign. And um, so to verify this, what we're going to do is let me take the characteristic polynomial, PA of T, and let's factor it. So that the roots are the eigenvalues, T minus lambda 1 times T minus lambda 2 all the way up to T minus lambda N. And if you think about this, if you were to factor this out, this polynomial is going to be T to the N. And then if you think about what the coefficient of t to the n minus 1 is, that's what you get by multiplying n minus 1 t's. So, so for n minus 1 of these terms, pick t and then multiply that product by the remaining lambda i. Um, so, so for example, if I multiply this t times you know, t, uh, all of these t's, and then I multiply that by negative lambda 1. And then the same thing for all of the t's and negative lambda 2. In other words, it's just these, um, the coefficient is negative lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda n minus 1. So nothing complicated about this. Um, sorry, this, this should not be n minus 1. This, this is uh, lambda n. So, so nothing complicated about this. Just a little bit messy with the algebra. And then so forth in the next etc. And then at the end, what you get is what's the constant term going to be? It's the product of the lambda i's up, up to negative sign. So it's going to be negative 1 to the n times lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda n. So this is the characteristic polynomial. And what I'm claiming by here is that this this coefficient here, 
is the is the trace of a and this coefficient right here without the negative sign is the determinant of a and this falls out really from looking at this and thinking about what the trace and the determinant is in terms of this actual determinant of ti minus a. Let's do the determinant first because it's easier. So look what happens when you plug in t equals 0. So first of all, if you plug in t equals 0 up here to the characteristic polynomial, which I should remind you, this thing is the characteristic polynomial. So up here, you are clearly left with the constant term, which is the product of the lambda i's times negative 1 to the n. Now let's plug in t equals 0 up here. If you do that, what you get is the determinant of negative a. So 0 minus a. And the determinant of negative a is negative 1 to the n times the determinant of a. Right? Because if there's um, a and negative a differ by multiplying each row and column by negative 1, and that's going to change the determinant um, by negative 1, or by um, negative 1 times the number of rows or columns. So now what we have is, let me use that highlighter again, so we have negative 1 times the determinant of a equals negative 1 times the product of the eigenvalues. So the determinant of a equals the product of the eigenvalues, and that confirms that confirms this identity here. Okay, the trace is next. This one's a little trickier to see, but let's go back to this thinking, or this way of thinking about the determinant. Um, so th if we compute the determinant of this complicated thing in this way, then there's only one term that's going to give us a t to the n. And that's from that's what we get when we multiply all of these things together. So again, that, that's the analog of, of this first one, or the, this first one right here. Um, now also notice that any other non-identity permutation is going to miss at least two of these diagonal elements. So in other words, there, there's no way that we can circle um, n of these diagonal elements, or n minus one of these things, and then choose anything other than the last one. So if we have n minus one of these chosen, the last one is forced. We can't ever pick you know, anything up here. So in other words, out of all of these n factorial sums that we get here, all, or, um, all but one of them involve powers of t that are less than n minus one. So the t to the n term and the t to the n minus 1 term come entirely from this, this, the analog of this term right here, the multiplying only along the diagonal, uh, 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 multiplying these along the diagonal. So um, what is that? So let me write that down. If, if you multiply these things together, what you get is t minus a11 times t minus a2, 2, all the way up to t minus a, n, n. So this is not the, the characteristic polynomial, but this is one term, one of these n factorial terms in this determinant, and it's the only term that contains a t to the n, and, a t, and as well a t to the n minus 1. So if we want to understand what the coefficient of t to the n, so well, clearly the t to the n term here is is monic, so it's t to the n, and then the t to the n minus 1 term is going to be a11 plus a22 plus all the way up to a n n t to the n minus 1. And then there's going to be other terms as well. All of these are lower power terms. But what this says now is that this, so this is the only t to the n minus 1 coefficient that can occur in the entire determinant. And so that must be equal to the t to the n minus 1 coefficient in the characteristic polynomial 
In other words, the trace of A has to be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay, so nothing too technically di difficult here, but it is just really keeping track of the coefficients, and it is vital to, under, you know, to understand and to use this property of the determinant. I mean, there's probably another way to think of it, but I think this really is the easiest way to understand why these two things are true. Let me now remind you of a remark that I think we made in the last lecture. It's fairly easy. It says if we have an eigenvalue eigenvector pair, so AV equals lambda V, then A to the KV equals lambda to the KV. In other words, lambda to the K is an eigenvalue of A to the K with the same eigenvector. And this is easy to see why, right? Because if you have AV equals lambda V, then A squared V equals A times AV equals A times lambda V equals lambda times lambda V equals lambda squared V. And inductively, this works for all integers K, all positive integers K. Actually, much more is true. And that leads us to the spectral mapping theorem, which says if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then for any polynomial Q of T, Q of lambda is an eigenvalue of Q of A. And conversely, every eigenvalue of Q of A has this form. In other words, is Q of lambda for some eigenvalue of lambda. Let's prove this. This is also straightforward. So let's say that, uh, that Q of T is Cn t to the n plus all the way up to c1 t plus c naught. And then q of a v equals cn a to the n plus dot 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 c1 a plus c naught i times v. And we can see that this is equal to um, C n a to the n v plus dot 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 C one a v plus C naught v. And now we just apply our previous remark to each of these terms and we get C n lambda to the n v plus dot 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 C one lambda v plus C naught V. And of course we can factor out the V. So this is C N lambda to the N plus dot 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 C one lambda plus C naught times V. And you can see that this what we have right here is just the polynomial evaluated at lambda. So that's Q of lambda V. So we have Q of A times V is Q of lambda times V, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. So now for the converse. Every eigenvalue of Q of A has this form. So let me use a different color. I'm gonna use my black pen now. So for part B, I'm gonna pick an eigenvalue. Let's call it mu. Mu B an eigenvalue of Q of A. So this is equivalent to saying that the determinant of, I'm gonna be careful, Q of A minus mu I is zero. So what we're gonna do is this thing here, Q of A minus lambda I is a polynomial in A. Let's figure out what the polynomial is as a variable T. So in other words, let's, Let's say that Q of T minus mu, th this is the polynomial that when you plug A into, we get this. So, and this is a polynomial, say, of degree N. So let's factor it into its roots. So this is equal to some constant C times T minus lambda 1 times T minus lambda 2 all the way up to T minus lambda N. So if we take this polynomial and we plug A into it, again, 
we get what we got up there, but th this is it factored. So in other words, Q of A minus mu I. So, so here we, we are plugging A, we're taking this thing and plugging in A. So let me, let me say that plug in A is C times A minus lambda one I, A minus lambda two I dot, 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 A minus lambda N I. So here's the key. This thing is non-invertible. And this is a composition of N or product of N maps. So if you have the product of, of N matrices that and the product is and, and that has determined at zero, then at least one of these has determined at zero. Or think of them in terms of maps. If you have the composition of N maps, which is non-invertible, at least one of them must be non-invertible. So thus, sum at least one, A minus lambda J I is non-invertible. And I claim that that is our eigenvalue. So remember, that's equivalent this thing being non-invertible or the determinant being zero is equivalent to um, lambda j is an eigenvalue of a. And so what we have is, so since lambda j is a root of q of t minus mu, what that says, I'm going to move up a little bit because I'm running out of room. That says that, well, q of lambda j minus mu equals zero. And now let me move that up here because I'm really running out of room there. And that says that q of lambda j equals mu. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. Every eigenvalue of Q of A, we took one, we called it mu, has the form Q of lambda, is indeed equal to, you, to Q of lambda j for some eigenvalue j of A. A quick corollary of the spectral mapping theorem tells us something about what happens when we take A and plug it into its own characteristic polynomial. So this is a linear map, and as a corollary, we get that every eigenvalue of this linear map is zero. Now, why is this true? Well, let's, let's take P A of A, and let's consider an eigenvalue um, of that. Let's say mu, so P A of A, v equals mu v. And then this says that every eigenvalue of this is going to be of the, so mu is going to be of the form p a of lambda for, for some eigenvalue lambda, um, for some I, lambda that's, that's an eigenvalue of a. And we know that the eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. In other words, P A of all such lambdas are equal to zero. So in other words, that says that mu must be equal to zero. So what linear maps have all eigenvalues equal to zero? Well, clearly the zero linear map does, but other ones, let's say three by three matrices, as long as you have an upper triangular matrix and zeros on the diagonal, something like one, two, three, that is going to have all eigenvalues equal to zero. So this is one where T sends, remember that the, the columns tell us about the linear combinations of, of the basis vector. So T of E1 equals zero, T of E2 equals E1, and T of E3 equals 2E1 plus 3E2. So there, there's a lot of linear maps that have this property. But it turns out that 
this condition can be significantly strengthened. Again, much more is true. Not only are all of the eigenvalues of this mysterious linear map, PA of A zero, but that map is indeed the zero map for any linear map A. Before we prove this, let me give you a fake proof. See if you can figure out why this does not work. So that this is a fake proof. It's tempting to do something like this. It says, well, so PA of T is the determinant of T I minus A. So why can't you just plug A into this directly. P A of A is the determinant of, well, T is equal to A. We get A minus A, which is the determinant of zero, which is zero. Now it's really tempting to do this because symbolically it does work. However, we can't necessarily just say that the determinant function and plugging in um, a matrix or linear map A are necessarily going to commute in this manner. manner. So with the technicality, it looks like it should work. It gives us motivation for maybe for why this thing should be true, but we can't just plug this in and say we are done. Now, most proofs of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, or at least most of the ones I've seen, involve matrices. They involve, first of all, showing that every matrix is similar to an upper triangular matrix and then doing something like that. But that's that's a little bit messy and it's also unsatisfying because this isn't a property of matrices. It's a property of linear maps and a proof really should involve just linear maps. So we'll do that next. First, we will get an easy case out of the way. So let me do this up here, proof of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. And the easy case is arguably the most common one, which is when A is diagonalizable. In other words, um, when there's a basis of eigenvectors. So anytime A has distinct eigenvalues, we have this case. And then there's other cases like the identity matrix where there's multiple eigenvalues that are the same, but it still is diagonalizable. So uh, case one, which is easy, is when A is diagonalizable, And let's say that I get the eigenvectors are v1 up to vn. So in this case, um, let's, let's pick any x in our vector space. We need to show that p a of a is 0, which means if you apply this to any x, you get the 0 vector. So p a of a times x, um, well, um, I need to write x as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. So let's do that. So that's p a of a times, let's say that x is, I don't want to use a's anymore, um, c1 v1 plus dot 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 c n v n. So let's say that this is x. Now, of course, we can write this as c1 p a of a um, v1 plus dot 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 c1 p sorry cn p a of a v n. So of course this is c1 as we just showed p a of lambda 1 v1 plus dot 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 cn p a of lambda n vn, and we know that the eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, so all of these are equal to zero, and so therefore this is equal to zero as claimed. So this is the easy case. Now we just need to drop the assumption that A is diagonalizable, and we're actually going to prove this from scratch. So the simple case that we just did in the previous slide is actually unnecessary. But I think it's still worth having seen that because it shows 
how simple that case really is. And that is by far the most common case. Usually we have a randomly encountered matrix. It has distinct eigenvalues and hence a basis of eigenvectors. It's hard to construct a matrix that doesn't. So in the general case, this can be proven by using the Jordan canonical form, which is something that we'll see uh, shortly, involves matrices. Though behind the scenes, we really don't need matrices for that. We need something called generalized eigenvectors. But um, the fact that I can fit the entire proof of this on this slide um, means that I would prefer to do it this way. So we're going to start with the lemma, which really seems out of the blue. Um, and it's not that hard, it's not, but it's one of those ones that is more notationally confusing than it is conceptually confusing. So if we have polynomials P and Q with matrix coefficients, so in other words, suppose P of T is Pn T to the N plus dot 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 P1T plus P naught, and Q of T is similar, um, Qm T to the M plus dot 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 Q1T plus Q naught, what we are going to be interested in doing is coming up with a formula for the product P of T, Q of T, in terms of the PIs and the QIs. Now, we normally can do this with polynomials, but we have to be careful because these coefficients do not necessarily commute. And then what I want to do is I want to talk about what P of A, Q of A is. Okay, let's get started. The product of P and Q is of course a polynomial. And if P has degree N and Q has degree M, then that polynomial will have degree at most N plus M. I say at most because it's possible to take two matrices and multiply them and get zero, even if these things are non-zero. And I should say that I've been saying matrix coefficients and I want to do this in a matrix-free way. So that sounds contradictory, but really matrix coefficients these are linear maps. It's just easier to say matrix than linear maps, but there's nothing, I'm not choosing a basis in advance. Okay, so what this is saying, this lemma is, first of all, it's giving a formula for what these coefficients are. So I claim that the coefficient of T to the K is just the product over all pairs of PIs and JIs whose sum adds, or such that, i plus j, in other words, x to the i times x to the j is x to the k. So the sum adds up to k. And I think this is fairly easy to see with an example. Let me show you. So suppose we have a t squared plus b t plus c times d t squared plus e t plus f. So if we multiply this out, we get, so What's, what's the coefficient of, of t to the fourth? It's just going to be the product of, of the two terms um, whose powers add up to four. So that, that's AD. What about the coefficient of t cubed? So how do we get um, pairs of things that add up to t cubed? Well, we have t squared times t. We also have t times t squared. And that's it. So this is going to be, what was that? A, E plus B, D. Okay, so what about um, T squared? So how do we get things that add up to, um, or I guess the, the exponents add up to um, T squared? So we have, so we can do A, here we have a T squared times the constant term. Here we have a, B t, so a, a linear term times a linear term, B times E. And then we have a C, a linear term times a quadratic term here. So again, we have A F plus B E plus C D and, and so on. I'm not going to finish it, but I think you get the idea. So this is not hard with this thing. It's just keeping track of things and it's, it's common sense. And the last thing I want to mention is it's common if we have, you know, if you're doing A, or just in general, A plus B times A plus B. So A plus B squared. If these are numbers, you know, you write this as A squared plus B squared plus AB plus BA. And if these are numbers, you would say, oh, this is 2AB. 
But if these are matrices, you can't necessarily assume that AB is equal to BA. It's generally not going to be. And so you cannot necessarily assume that. But there are cases. So if all of these matrices, if, if A, if the matrix, well, if, if all the PIs and all the QIs commute, then, then you could do something like this. And what, where we're going with this is we are going to want to take this polynomial R of A, and we're going to want to plug in A. And we want to know when R of A is P of A times Q of A. And we, we don't, and clearly if all of the PIs and all the QIs and A's all, and the A all commutes, we are golden. But we actually don't need all of that. In fact, all we need is for A to commute with the QIs over here. We don't care about the PIs. And if that happens, then P of A times Q of A equals R of A. This is actually fairly easy to see. That's why I'm leaving it as an exercise. If we just look at this term PI times QJ, we can check this basically term by term. So PI, remember, these are the coefficients of the terms that are T to the I in here and T to the J in here. So PI, TI times QJ, TJ. Let's take this and let's plug in A. If we do that, what we get is PI A to the I, QJ A to the J. And notice that all we really need is for this I, this A term to commute with the QJ. And if that happens, then we get P I Q J times A to the I plus J. And that is exactly what the coefficient of R to the K is. And so that, that's why this holds. We will apply this lemma to the polynomial Q of T equals T I minus A. So this is set up. So the determinant of this polynomial is just the characteristic polynomial. Of course, to apply this lemma, I need to tell you what matrix P we're going to use because it will appear here and then later down here when we plug in A. And this will involve cofactors. Now, cofactors is something that I have a lecture on. That's, I think it's called minors and cofactors. So please watch that lecture first. But even if you have seen it, it is a definition that doesn't come up all that often. And so it's easy to forget, so I, I will review it. But first I want to give an overview as to why we are even doing this. So if CJI is the JI cofactor, um, and you know what, I'll tell you what it is now. So um, the JI cofactor, you take the ith row and you take the, the jth column and you cross out both and then you take um, and then C i j is going to be negative 1 to the i plus j times the minor i j. So that's the determinant of, of what's left. So that, that's all the cofactor is. And um, Kramer's theorem, um, remember what that involved? That was a, if we had a system ax equals u, it gave us an fo explicit formula for xk based on cofactor. So xk was the sum from i equals 1 up to n of ui times cik divided by the determinant of a. Now we don't really care about Kramer's theorem here, but a corollary of Kramer's theorem was a formula for the inverse. Namely, a inverse is one divided by the determinant of a times this cofactor matrix cji. So in other words, the ijth entry of, of a inverse is the jith cofactor divided by the determinant. So some people so, so some people actually call this the, the transpose of the cofactor matrix. Because if, if you order things normally with the ij entry instead of the jith entry, um, that's the cofactor matrix. And the transpose of this is sometimes called the adjoint matrix, or I think it's also called the, uh, the adjucate. But I'm just going to call it, it this matrix right here. It's a matrix of cofactors. I, we don't need all of these different names. But um, Look what happens if I take this and I multiply both sides by the determinant of A times times A. So both sides by that. Now the left-hand side is the determinant of A 
times the identity. And the right-hand side, the determinant cancels, and I get this cofactor matrix times A. Now, of course, this holds if, if A is non-invertible, but I claim that this also holds that if A is, um, sorry, this holds if A is invertible, but if A is not invertible, if the determinant is zero, I claim that this formula holds, even though this one in blue makes no sense. And so let's think about what this is saying. So on the left-hand side, we have this diagonal matrix, determinant of A on the diagonals, determinant of A, and of course, it's going to be zero everywhere else. And the right-hand side, we have this matrix of cofactors. So this is but it's, it's a transpose of how we would normally index them. So this is C11, this is C21, this is, and then all the way up to CN1, and this is C12, all the way up to C1N, and then this is CNN. And so this matrix times A11, A12, now I'm normal, or, um, indexing them normally up to A1n, A21, A22, all the way up to An1 and Ann. So I claim that the product of these two matrices is, this cofactor matrix is like almost the inverse of this. So if I divide by the determinant of A, the, uh, these are inverses. But if the determinant of A is zero, I can't do that. But I, I, this is, I can still multiply by these, and I get, um, in, in this case, if the determinant is zero, I, I get the zero matrix because the determinant is going to be on these diagonals. So this is like the closest thing we have to the inverse of A if, if A is not invertible. Okay, so why is this true? So um, th this is something that we could have done. Um, um, we studied Kramer's theorem. I chose not to do it. I, I chose to focus on systems of equations. This is a little detour we could have taken. But looking back at it, I think it's. I, I think it'll be clear why this is true. So let's um, let's look at this first row times this first column. So so as an example, I'm not going to prove this for all i and j. For, uh, I mean, we really have to sh show that the, the ijth entry is going to be zero if i and j are different and, and the determinant if we're going down the diagonal. And I think it's easy to see this by example. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to generalize it for i and k. So if, if, we're, if we're doing this row times this column, then think about what that is. That is, that is um, a11, c11 plus um, a21, c22 plus all the way up to a n n c n n and that is the laplace expansion of the matrix a so if we have a 1 1 a 1 2 to a 1 n and a 2 1 up to a 2 n um, sorry up to a n 1 if we work our way down this column and and we do a1 times this this minor, uh, minus A2 times this this minor, etc., or technically A2 times the cofactor down to A this one times that minor, we we do get the this is is the determinant of A. However, if instead, what happens if we multiply this row by the second column? Let's let, let's see what happens there. In that case, we get A. 1, 2, C, 1, 1, plus A, um, 2, 2, C, 2, 1, plus all the way up to A, N, 2, C, N, 1. So now we have this thing where we have the indices don't match the cofactors. And what I want to show you what, what that is like is imagine that we had taken the matrix A. So it is, it is a, uh, a, uh, I'll put in C's later, A12, A22, all the way up to A2N, and this is A1N, all the way up to ANN. But in the first, but um, in the first column, 
suppose that I had repeated the second column. So let me do A12 here, A22, two, two, all the way down to A2n. So clearly the determinant of this guy is going to be zero because we have two repeated columns. And notice that when I multiply this row by that column, that's exactly what I'm doing. So this, these cofactors really tell us that we are working our way down this, this column right here. But the fact that I have different AIJ entries here, so the fact that I have these entries tell us that this first column is populated by this second column. So that's what happens if we repeat columns. So, so this linear combination here is going to be zero. And so in summary, anytime that we have the, the ith row in the jth column, and i are diff is different than j, you can think of this as replacing the jth column with the with the ith uh, in, in a, replace the jth column with the ith column and do the Laplace expansion there, which will give us zero. So this is an outline of a sketch for why this formula holds. And this is the thing that I'm going to use up here. But instead of A, I'm going to use Q. So in summary, I want to pick my P of, of T to be this matrix of cofactors. And of course, there's no of T in here, but because it is cofactors of of, uh, I should say this cofactors of Q in this case, this is going to be a function of T as well. So in other words, my, my Q is, so summarize, my, my Q is this polynomial, just a linear polynomial that whose determinant is the characteristic polynomial. And my P is going to be this, this matrix of cofactors. And by construction, the product of P and Q is it's not the identity, but it's the identity times the determinant of Q, which in this case is the characteristic polynomial. Okay, so I know that's a lot, but let's let's move on. I think we have all the pieces. I think the hardest part is behind us. So if P is equal to this matrix CJI of cofactors, sometimes called the adjoint, then R of T, in other words, the product of P and Q is just the determinant of Q of T times I. And we know the determinant of that is the characteristic polynomial, like that. Now we want to plug A into here because we want to use this last result. And remember, we need A to commute with the QIs. And it clearly does because what are the coefficients of this matrix. What are the matrix coefficients? I and A, or negative A. And clearly A commutes with both of those. So because A commutes with the coefficients and Q of A equals zero, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug A in right here. And because I have the, the conditions required here, if I plug A into there, I'm going to get P of A, Q of A, as I have down here. And of course, P of A times Q of A is the determinant of Q of A times I is the characteristic polynomial of A evaluated at A. And because Q of A equals zero, this product and therefore P A of A is equal to zero. And that is the Cayley Hamilton theorem, which is what we needed to prove. And I think I'm going to leave it there. Stick around next time for the minimal polynomial and generalized eigenvectors. See you then.